Welcome to the Be That 1% Podcast. I'm your host, James Silvis, Mindset Specialist and Performance Coach. And here on the show, I'm going to challenge you to think deeper, commit to greatness, and develop a stronger mindset. You'll hear stories from those who are living life on their terms, and you'll receive strategies that will help you level up. So the question is, are you ready to be your own 1%? Let's get started. Hey there, welcome to the Be That 1% podcast. If this is your first time, welcome. And if you are a return listener, welcome home. I wanna thank you for your time, your attention, your energy, and for consistently showing up to this podcast, listening to these guests, taking away the insights, and applying them in your life. My goal with creating this is to, to share all the insights, the strategies, the frameworks, the people, the conversations that I have on a daily basis with you. Because I know how much these conversations change my life and how much they keep me on the right path. And I only hope that these episodes do that for you. And if you haven't already, please head over to iTunes, share your your comments, your suggestions, give me a five-star review, help me get this podcast to more people. It's, it would be my dream to you know, get this to as many people as possible because you know we all know that we are what we tell ourselves, we are who we associate with. And, you know, if you find value in this podcast time after time or with any episode that you listen to, I ask that you share that, share that with your family, with your friends, with your business partner, with whoever you feel aligns with the message. And I'm very, very grateful that you're here. And in today's episode, you're going to hear from a man named Nick who faced some personal trauma and found a way to transform in his own way, on his own time, and and he'll talk about what he had to go through to get to the place that he currently is. And at the end, he wants to share a gift with all of you. And that gift is a is in the a link in my bio in the podcast notes, so you can find it there. But Nick, he'll tell you the story of how he created what he's creating. And once you hear the episode, it'll make sense on what that link is. But if you want the discount, you want the Be That 1% family hookup, uh, go click that link. And if it aligns, you know, get something for yourself or someone that you care for. And without further ado, let's jump into the episode. My guest today, Nick Motichka. Uh, him and I connected a few weeks ago and after hearing his story, I was like, okay, we got to tell this story. We got to share this with my audience and I want you to go as deep as you can in the time that we have in what your experience was, what you learned and how you've come out the way that you have. And, and so we're going to go into deep. I'll explain what that means, but I want to give a little backstory on who Nick is. He grew up in Alberta with a father who was a member of the RCMP. Nick, what does that stand for? The Royal Canadian Mounted Police. (laughs) There we go. And he spent, Nick has spent his whole life, basically most of his life, 23 years in various enforcement related positions, securities, loss prevention, bylaw services, Canadian customs, court and prisoner services, as well as the RCMB. And something happened where that completely shifted. And that's part a large part of what we're going to be talking about here today and, and also what he's currently doing now, following his passion, living in a, an alignment with his lifestyle and what his values are. But uh, there's something significant that changed the trajectory of his life. And that's where our story begins. <laughs> And Nick, I just want to welcome you to the show, man. And it's been great connecting with you the last few weeks. And I'm excited to hear more of your story here live for myself and and for our audience. So welcome to the show. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So we're talking law enforcement career, 23 plus years. Like that's pretty set in stone. Your father laid that path you seem to have followed in the footsteps at that point. And I think you even made reference to that when we spoke last, what shifted, what changed, why, why give it all up or why change uh, to a whole do different thing? Yeah. So I guess the beginning of the end was very early 2020. So 
Um, my wife and I had committed to making some lifestyle changes. So what that looked like for us was a diet change. So we did a, a gut, a 30 day gut reset starting January one. And then we both started meditating daily at that point. And then um, about a year prior, uh, cannabis actually had uh, become legalized again in Canada, or not again, sorry, for the first time it became legalized. And I had kind of rediscovered um, cannabis. And so for me, those three factors, the gut reset, the meditation and cannabis set me on a trajectory that uh, I could have never predicted um, mm. prior to that. So um, first of all, what what it looked like was um, about a month in, so around kind of the end of January 2020, I admitted for the first time that something wasn't right with me and what that was, was my sleep. So at that point I was working for the, actually for the Calgary police service. And I was in a, a unit called the gang suppression team. And so that was a, a shift work unit where we would work four 12 hour night shifts in a row. And so what had happened over the course of years for me was uh, my, my sleep had gone to, shit basically mm -hmm. for lack of a better term i couldn't sleep uh, more than a few hours in between my night shifts and so by the end of those four i was just i was no good i was no good at work i was no good at home it would take me about two days after my set of four was over to even feel kind of human again so at that point so that early 2020 time frame that was it for me. I was, I was done with, with feeling that way. And so I went to my family doctor and told him what was up for me. And that was the first time I ever admitted that, um, that everything wasn't, you know, just going well for me. And so that resulted in a, in a doctor's note that restricted my hours to midnight and in policing, as you can imagine, being a, a 24 seven shift work, heavy occupation, that is a little bit of career suicide um, limits you in terms of different units and, and different positions you can be in. And so, but I was, I was frustrated to the point where I was just at my wits end. And so I put that note in and just kind of let go of control of controlling the outcome and just, yeah, I guess <laughs> let it up to the, the universe to see what happened next. And so what that looked like, was um i so my time in gang suppression was done at that point because i couldn't work past midnight and so now we're into we're into kind of that march april time frame so of 2020 we all know exactly what was happening then in the world with lockdowns and and all the craziness that was happening around that point or that time and so they the calgary police service put me in a unit called the public affairs and media relations unit so this was now into May of 2020. And so this was the first time in my career where I was not working on the front lines. I was working actually from home at that point on a laptop in this media relations unit uh, where I was myself and another sworn member were the monitoring the, the Calgary Police Service's social media. So Facebook, Twitter, all the things and answering people's questions and putting out releases and and that was kind of my my job in um, within the police service. And I thought I thought I had it made at that point. I was getting my sleep back regulated, not working shift work, um, working Tuesday to Friday, a set schedule, having weekends off consistently, and life was really good. And then at the end of June of 2020, uh, George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in uh, Minneapolis, and all of a sudden my cushy online gig became one of the worst places to be so that was into the the defund the police movements and and all of the negativity around policing that spilled over from the the states and and into Canada absolutely and it was it was just a really dark time and the things people would say online especially um kind of the the keyboard warrior mentality of uh of you know, just how people are and saying things that that would never say to an officer's mm -hmm. face, of course. And so that summer kind of, I pushed through that darkness, not really having any insight into it at the time, but I was, I was definitely feeling it. 
And then uh, fast forward into September of 2020, September 16th, I opened my laptop one morning and I saw that a bunch of messages had come in from a young lady who I'd been previously messaging with. Her mother was missing um, and there was a police investigation, but it was, they weren't really doing much for her. And her mother was kind of a uh, marginalized um, addictions were an issue in and out of different shelters and um, the police, my police service that I was working for hadn't done anything for this lady. So I was trying to help her out. And so on this morning, September 16th, um, I received a bunch of messages um, from her through the Calgary Police Service Facebook page. And it was the first time anyone had seen the messages because they're not monitored overnight. And so the messages were a cry for help. She was she was suicidal. And I, for the first time in my career, I was unable to to act. I I kind of my tunnel or tunnel vision set in. I went into this catatonic state where I was just blankly staring at the screen. And there was parts of my brain that were that were still going. And I, I knew the things that I should be doing from the police standpoint. And that was, you know, calling the, the appropriate people to have a call for service generated, to have a, a car go and do a check on welfare on this lady. And I knew that that was what I needed to do, but I couldn't. I was just frozen in this weird state that I'd never experienced before. It's something in policing that um, is called actually code black. And it's mm. not a desirable state, as you can imagine, to to freeze under in a you know dynamic situation. Luckily for me, I was sitting at home um, on my on my chair on a laptop, so I wasn't um, you know out in public at that point. So I was frozen in this state for I don't even know how long actually. Um, and my wife came into the room and saw me and recognized, of course, that something was up, and she was able to kind of snap me out of it. And in that moment, I knew that something obviously wasn't right. This was new to me. I'd never experienced anything like this. And um, so I knew that I needed to call my supervisor number one. So I got on the phone. I went up into our bedroom and my supervisor, who is a, a civilian, actually, um, she answered the phone and I broke down and started crying for the first time as an adult. And I was trying to explain to her what was going on, which was, as you can imagine, quite difficult because I had no idea what was going on with me at that point. Right. Um, so got off the phone with her. She gave me, of course, the the day off, um, which I, I took. <laughs> and uh, I knew that my previous coping strategy of pushing down trauma. So throughout a career in policing up to this point, I was a 15 year member and then um, worked in different enforcement jobs before that. Um, my coping strategy was anytime I'd be reminded of a, a hard call or a hard situation that I'd been to or dealt with, I would just push it back down. It would, it would come up, like be reminded through a smell, through a location, through any number of ways. I would remember it and I would immediately know that, okay, this is not something that's comfortable for me and I don't want to deal with this right now. So I'm just going to push it down. So was that, that was what I, when you say pushing down, is that the same thing as compartmentalizing to you or are those different things? I think it is. Yeah. It's, okay. it's pushing it into an area of my body where I don't have to deal with it. So right. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that strategy um, which had got me through 15 years of policing to this point had run its course. It, it wasn't serving me any longer. And I, I knew that all of those hard calls had piled up or filled up. And I, I kind of pictured it like a cup. So in that moment, my cup filled up and overflowed and that pushing it down strategy just wasn't cutting it anymore. And I knew that I needed to seek help to actually process these unresolved traumas that I'd never allowed myself to, to go there or to process in any way, shape or form since they had happened. And some of them went back to early days in my RCMP career. So we're talking like almost 15 years old where they're still there. There's still unprocessed emotions and, and everything with it. But I just, I wasn't up until that point willing to do that. So I knew that that needed to change. And I vowed to myself that I wasn't going to go back to work until I had processed all of those hard calls and, and the unresolved trauma that lived in my body at that point. Hmm. 
there are a lot of people I'm sure listening, but in the world that go with the push down strategy. What do you think that that is, where does that come from? Is that a natural tendency that, that we think you think we all have? Is that a, a man, a men's thing that we do? Is that, uh, because there's not a safe space to talk about it. So where else are we going to put it? What is your, have, have you thought about that? And what's your thought on it? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of of a few of those factors that you mentioned. So for men, of course, traditionally not mm-hmm. supposed to show our feelings or show emotions or anything like that. And then um, as you can imagine in policing, it's a, it's a very masculine culture. Mm-hmm. And to the point where even female officers become masculine masculine masculinized uh, within that profession because that's the culture right is to not not show weakness not show any of that vulnerability or or any of those um those kind of traits and then i think there is a natural tendency as humans too when and for me when i when i didn't have those tools to to deal with with hard things hard memories traumas all that it was just it seemed normal to just ignore it and push that down because I, again, didn't have the the tools or the yeah. capacity or the bandwidth to, to deal with it at that point. So yeah. I think a combination of those things. And so when you found yourself in that catatonic state, what, now that you you're a few years removed from that and we'll get to the part of your story where you've worked through that, what happened now that you've had time to breathe and reflect on it in that moment that, someone listening could take proactive action towards to potentially save themselves from a situation like that. Yeah. So for me personally, I needed that full in your face kind of breakdown. Of course, I don't look at it at all like a breakdown now. It was it was a breakthrough. I I call it a breakthrough because that's exactly what it was. Um and quite honestly, it was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me outside of course, you know, meeting my wife and marriage and kids and all of the stuff. But um, me personally, in my own development, best thing that ever happened to me. So to avoid that, I think for a certain number of the population won't take those proactive steps before it's a full, you know, right. that, that rock bottom kind of situation. Uh, but if you recognize that you're going down that road, um, to take some proactive steps, um, and realize that this stuff isn't going away, right? Like trauma doesn't just over time disappear. It's just not how it works, right? You have to go back and actually process and and deal with it in order to have it move through you or else it just Mm -hmm. stays stuck in your body. So I would, I mean, it would be great if people would could recognize that and it would have been great for me to have recognized that and to have done something proactive. But um, again, I needed that, yeah. that like slap in the face to wake me up to realize, okay, silly bugger, like this mm-hmm. isn't working anymore. It's time to do something different. Was there anything specific about that moment as far as like you didn't have control when you wanted it or that was just the stacking of a, a, a unfortunate situation that someone was dealing with that that was is just one too many like was there what factors in that situation have you pulled out that triggered that state yeah so with some reflection and the benefit of hindsight of course there there's definitely a lot there so um it was a suicide related call that sent me kind of filled up my cup and then when I look back at the over my career, the, the majority of the unprocessed trauma that I'd experienced were suicide related calls. Mm. Mm. And then to go back even further, um, my on my brother's 18th birthday um, in a, you know, alcohol fueled, just bad situation, he threatened suicide and it was something I wasn't equipped for at all at that point. I'm about a year and a half older than him. So I was 19 and a bit year old young fella and I wasn't equipped to deal with that. And then my family wasn't equipped to deal with it. And so they just 
like ignored it like it never happened and we just moved on yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) we moved on with life and have never spoken about that incident since and so I think all of those that initial you know bad situation with my brother and then having witnessed numerous suicides throughout my career it it was just something that I always had a really hard time dealing with because Mm -hmm. I just again didn't have the the tools to to wrap my head around it or to process it yeah see that that's a really important distinction or or like factor of all of this I think anyone listening can relate to this in in some way where there's a part of your past where maybe you haven't taken the time to understand why there's such a strong reaction to a certain thing, right? Suicide in this case, but maybe it's abuse of some kind or it's uh, the way someone treats someone. And and because there's not a lot of self-awareness around why that is or how it came to be or or things haven't been processed, that can stack over time and manifest itself in, in unproductive ways or unhealthy ways, or just very dangerous ways that, um, until looked at, sat with, worked through, uh, with the facilitation of someone who is skilled in, in doing so. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's how we can avoid some of these situations or at least the severity of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then the the willingness on on our own part to yes. want to go in and, and deal with it because it's it's one of those things, right? Where you can tell someone until you're blue in the face about what they need to do, but yeah. until they've made that decision, it's just going right in one ear and out the other. Yeah. And so from this moment, right, you have this, she give your boss gives you the day off and then take us to the next part. Yeah. So I, um, I felt the call to be in nature that day. So I drove, we were living in Calgary or just South of Calgary, Alberta at that point, um, which is a short drive from the mountains. Uh, the Rocky mountains start about, you know, 45 minutes West of Calgary. So I drove out to the mountains and I sat on the banks of the elbow river, uh, by some waterfalls and I journaled, uh, about, my kind of priorities in life and what was important to me and what I wanted my life to look like. And I just spent the day in nature, just reflecting. And then that's of course um, when I decided that I wasn't going to go back to work until I had dealt with all of my, my unresolved traumas. And I just set on an unknown path of healing, not knowing at all what that was going to look like. And so, um, as you can imagine, I had to, you know, fill out lots of paperwork and whatnot because it was a, it happened at work. My, my breakthrough happened while I was on duty. And so there was insurance companies I had to talk to and WCB and psychologists and and all sorts of things. And I was just, for the first time in my life, I was just like, okay, what I have been doing isn't working. So I'm going to go kind of the opposite and just be an open book and just totally vulnerable about this stuff. And so that's exactly what I did. And I was just telling people what my experience was up until that point in the hopes that someone could, could help me. And so again, with the benefit of self-reflection and hindsight, I realized that the sleep was, was only a small portion of what the effects that these unresolved traumas were having on me. And so it, was mood related. My patience was no good. So I was, I was not the husband I knew I could be. I was not the father. I knew I could be the friend, the son, the uncle, all of the things. I just wasn't, I wasn't good. And then I was at a point where I couldn't deal with any sort of any sort of like adversity in life. Like things would just, I would just shut down whenever anything would get kind of hard and I couldn't watch anything with any sort of violence at all. Um, so no TV, movies, anything with any sort of violence. I just couldn't handle it. I would just have to like walk out of the room. Um, same with music, any sort of aggressive music. I just, it would just put me in this like anxious, bad state. And so um, all of those things had taken years to develop and become part of how I was showing up in the world. Um, and it happened so slowly that I wasn't aware of it at the time. But again, looking back now, I, I see how how that had all come to affect me in my day-to-day life. Hmm. And then, so I'm thinking about you as a, fa- 
so the first thing that was coming through my mind is going out to nature. I think nature is like the best psychologist. <laughs> You know, it forces you to be somewhat present. It forces you to to reprioritize what's important, right? At least that's what it does for me. And that's what it does for a lot of people that I talk about. I'm not surprised that you brought out your pen and you started journaling nowhere else but nature. Like that's, I think that's just a really helpful remedy for a lot of things. It's just get into nature more, get your feet on the ground, get, get near water, climb a mountain, like get around life right? And away from the hustle and bustle of a city or, you know, normal life that, that you operate in. So that was the first thing. The second thing was like how, how that was for you as a father. And I'm curious if your kids mentioned anything to you, or if this was just your meta-ness about how you thought you were acting towards your kids. Um, you know, having two kids myself, I'm I'm trying to place myself in your situation and figure out like how I would be if things are unorganized or if they act up and they're supposed to do something, but they're not doing it. Like what could potentially happen in those situations? Anything there? Yeah, I'm, my kids are and were pretty young at the time, okay. so Got they it. didn't have not that they've told me they didn't have any. Yeah warning signs or, or we're seeing anything in me. And, um, so it wasn't that so much, but, um, yeah, it's, I mean, kids will, will show you wherever you're unhealed, right. And yeah. all the triggers and everything. And so it's, uh, it's definitely something that I've, I've realized was, yeah. I was just ignoring up until that point. And I was just, I was just reacting and not with any sort of insight. And then I was just repeating generational stuff too, right? Like going back to the way I was raised and then the way my parents were raised. And it's, it just, it doesn't stop until one generation decides to, right? And so if we don't heal what has been passed on to us in the way, you know, the, that we were raised that maybe we wouldn't have chosen for ourselves if we uh if we had the choice if we don't consciously stop that then it's going to be up to your kids to heal that and um on the banks of that river that day in nature after having my breakthrough i i just i knew that i didn't want to continue on and pass that on to my kids and then um just to take it one step further um policing for me was was a job that i chose because it was known having a father that that was in that life. It was, it was all I ever knew. And so it was really ingrained in me, the importance of having a pension and having benefits and having a stable income. And it was just natural for me to go down that road because that was the the blueprint that was kind of laid out for me. Um, but not maybe the best way to choose your career because I mean, we're all so unique. Right. And I realized quite quickly in the, at the beginning of my policing career that while I thought that that was going to be something that I would love and, and be just passionate about, that wasn't the case at all. Yeah. When I got out of training and into the real world, I quickly found like, Whoa, this is, this is not at all what I thought it was going to be. And so I was living out of alignment for, you know, my entire adult life tr truly. Yeah. And so that this moment, this breakthrough kind of brought in all of this all of this stuff that I now had to kind of sort Storm. through and figure out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big time. But exactly what I needed to, in order yeah. to make positive steps to move forward. So there, the, I have on my notes here the th two things that I wanted to touch on with what you just said. So I'm glad that you kind of took us there. The the pressure that kids feel to maybe follow in the footsteps of their parents, right? And I think, I, and I'm a, I'm obviously a man, so I'm looking at it from a that lens, like. I didn't necessarily feel the pressure to have to do what my dad did in the same industry, but because my dad was an entrepreneur and had his own businesses, I was more likely to have that. And so I do, and I'm grateful that that was, and I understand that there are people out there who may feel immense pressure to do the same thing that their parents are doing. How, how, have you seen that not just with your life, but with others' lives, right? That's like my first question. And then the second one is the voice inside of your head that I, I, I believe you mentioned the last time we spoke about like, this really isn't inspiring to me, like being in this. I For some reason, I'm just not feeling like 
This is where I truly belong, but I feel like I have to. So I'm just going to keep going. How, yeah. yeah. Talk and talk about how like that compounds over time, ignoring that voice and how that could possibly also have a, had led to that catatonic moment. Yeah, absolutely. So I've come to realize that I chose my career, not only because of the, you know, the patterning and the example that was set by, by my parents, but also um, my, my wife, who I call my Oracle, um, because she has uh, pointed out to me here, it was probably coming up on two years ago, that I chose my career from my wounded inner child. And so what that meant, or what that means is that I wasn't, I didn't feel seen or heard or felt like I was really like the priority as a, as a child. And so in order to get that um, uh, acceptance from my parents, I subconsciously thought, well, if I become a police officer and follow in my dad's footsteps, then they'll be proud of me. Right. And then they'll see me. And then not only will they see me, but I'm wearing this uniform and this gun and all the things. And so I'll be seen and heard by the, you know, general public as well. And so I think that had a big factor in my career choice um, as well, which isn't a good like, way to choose yeah. your career at all from your wounded inner child. But that was my reality. And, and again, very on a, on a subconscious level, it yeah. certainly wasn't something I ever thought of. Uh, but as soon as my wife told me that I was just, I just sat there and I was quiet and she thought she offended me and like really upset me. And then, but it was just me. Like it was a truth bomb. Like just, it just hit me right in my heart. And it was like, yeah, that's, that makes total sense to me. So um, and don't get me wrong, there was parts of policing that that definitely appealed to me, um, especially before I got into it and knew kind of the realities of it. And that was I do and I, I did and I still do have a desire to to help people. And so I thought that I would be able to go out there and and truly be that person to in the people's moment of need and uh, be able to, to actually make an impact, which is was pretty naive. Um, certainly those situations happen in a policing career, but not at all like you think it would maybe like as a naive young man or woman uh, wanting to get into that profession. So um, wounded inner child and then um, just following in someone else's footsteps that um, again, we're all so different that it just doesn't make sense that I would have... <laughs> been happy in the same career that my dad was in and also um my dad ended up being quite bitter and, and jaded by the end of his time in policing so he didn't even like policing and so I picked the career that he didn't like in order to get acceptance from him like it's it's all kind of messed up when you think about it or subjectively yeah yeah and then I, that totally makes sense and, and that's cool that you're able to see that now and I'm sure that that was a big revelation moment and the voices in your head of like, when did that start? Was that initially like right when you started? Yeah. So I thought that policing was going to be it, right? Like I'd worked in all these different jobs and I was gung ho. And like, I thought this was, this was going to be amazing. And I got to training. So uh, with the RCMP training is in Regina, Saskatchewan. It's called Depo. It's where all Mounties from across Canada go for their training and got there. And I thought, wow, this is going to be awesome. And then it wasn't. <laughs> and I, I didn't love the training, uh, but I was able to get through it and, and do quite well. And then I thought, okay, once I start working, then, then life is going to be good. And, and I'm going to be just happy as, as all, as all heck. <laughs> and, uh, then got out and started working in the real world. And so I got posted to uh, a town called Sherwood Park, Alberta, which is, it's a bigger center just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. So it's um, yeah, kind of a big metropolitan sort of area and got out and immediately found that I wasn't happy at all. And it wasn't what I expected. And so for me, the, the things that stood out were, just the the level of deception. So every day that's, you're just sorting through lies. So basically everyone lies to the police, right? And 
it's because it's a self-protection thing, right? It's it, so it makes total sense, but at the same time, that's the energy that you're dealing with every day, every call, every traffic stop is sorting through what the truth is and what's kind of what people are just saying to protect themselves. And that's like the little old lady at the traffic stop who just blew a stop sign right in front of you. She'll lie and like it's, and then that really struck me as like, oh, wow. Yeah. No one is being honest with me basically. And I'm left to sort through the, the lies. And then, so, and then the energy of all of those calls are negative as you can expect, right? Like um, whenever the police are called, it's not because people are having a good day. Right. And so that being in, in that sort of energy all the time, it just really, yeah, just, I didn't it's enjoy fun. it. And it was progression over time where I really just felt like I was out of alignment and it makes total sense now looking back that of, of course it felt bad because I wasn't, I'm, I wasn't doing what I would, I'm here to do like my soul's purpose. And it just, it felt heavy and I didn't see a way out. It was, I signed up to do this job and I thought, no, I signed up. And then stubbornness, right. Too is kicks in. And I thought, Oh, I'll just, I'll do my 25 years and then I'll retire and then life will be good. And that was kind of my only option. And I didn't see any other alternative uh, outside of that. Yeah. And so you go through, I, I believe you said a year or, or so with, therapy and seeing various, you know, healers or therapists and psychologists, and none of that is sticking, none of it's really helping. Um, they're not seeming to crack the code. And then something happens. Tell us about that. Yeah. So those traditional therapies, I, I pursued them. I was all in, I was doing the eye movement stuff and exposure therapies and, and different um, traditional therapies that were being offered to me. And I wasn't, I just wasn't getting any, I wasn't getting back to myself. And so in September of 2021, um, WCB put me in a, a program called the return to work program. And so it was two appointments with a psychologist a week and two appointments with a occupational therapist. And the program is called return to work. And so that was their goal, right? They were pushing me hard to, get me back to work. And I was at a real low point at that time in my mental health. And I just, I wasn't doing well. And, and again, those traditional therapies just weren't getting me back to myself. And so I had an intuitive knowing around that time that there was something in plants and in plant medicine and in nature that was, that was going to be beneficial to me. And so um, I'd spent the, actually the majority of my career in policing in drug enforcement specifically, both with the RCMP and with Calgary police. I spent um, a couple of years or two and a half years with Calgary, actually in an undercover role in a drug unit and um, had been around drug enforcement, a, a good chunk of my career. And so like any good drug cop would do, I just decided to grow my own mushrooms. Um, so that's what I did. I, uh, ordered a kit off, uh, the internet and I started growing these things and I didn't know what I was going to do with them exactly. I had no grand plan, but I just had this inner knowing that that was going to be something for me. And so I was at a point where I was not getting, not getting the results I wanted from, um, the professionals that were trying to help me. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll just grow these things and see what happens. So, that's what I did. And so at that point, my spiritual journey had really accelerated as well, starting, of course, right back to that beginning time frame in 2020, it had been accelerating throughout that um, intermediate time. And I so I grew this, these, the psilocybin on a sacred geometry clearing plate. And I was doing Reiki on the mushrooms regularly, and just sending them good energy, basically, uh, with the intention of not knowing exactly what I was going to do with them, but knowing that they were some part of my healing. So pushed through that program, that WCB return to work program. Um, those four appointments a week that went from September till December at the end of that program, I was at like my ultimate, I was felt worse than I ever had at any point. Those two ladies with that return to work program 
uh, traumatized me more than I think anything that I actually experienced on the job in policing. And it was just like, they were just pushing me and pushing me to return to work, but without actually dealing with any of the root cause stuff. It was just like, just trying to get me off of the books basically and, and back into uh, my position with the Calgary police service. And I felt that every appointment and it just put me in a really bad place. So at the end of that program, WCB gave me basically an ultimatum. They said, you have 48 hours to make a decision. Are you going back to work or are you resigning? Like that was, that was my choice I'd had. And so with my back up against the wall, I, um, so I'll go back to my Oracle here. So my wife had told me a few months before that, that what I needed was a shaman who was also a psychologist. And so a few months go by and I kind of forgotten what she told me. And then in that moment with my back up against the wall, I realized, you know what I need? I need a shaman that's a psychologist. And then I convinced myself that I came up with the idea, but of course she did. Um, so in that moment, I just, I Googled it and I found one and she happened to be in Calgary. And so I called her up right then and there. And I spoke to her on the phone and she wasn't able to help me. She was busy teaching. And so she kind of put me off and she to, uh, referred me to a ketamine clinic. And at that point in my journey, I wasn't interested in, in any sort of a synthetic or chemical or pharmaceutical at all. And up until that point, I mean, traditional doctors had wanted to prescribe me all sorts of things, but I refused just in an inner knowing that I, that wasn't, that wasn't the right thing for me. And so I knew that, um, in that moment that yeah, plants were going to be it. And so I wasn't interested in the ketamine therapies at that point. I since have, have changed my perspective and I'm a lot more open to that. But at that point I, I was mm -hmm. thinking just pure nature. And um, so I didn't know what I was going to do. And then a weekend passed and then she actually called me back the next week and was like, she'd been her own, you know, inner guidance had told her that she needed to help me. So she called me back and told me that she was going to, she was going to make it happen. And then um, found out later that I was actually her first um, client with psychedelics that wasn't a, a friend or a family member. And so mm -hmm. that was her own resistance was, um, mm -hmm. was kicking in there. So it's kind of interesting to see how, uh, how that happens even with yeah, professionals. Yeah. And so, um, we scheduled it for early January or sorry, actually it was late January of 2022. And so, um, it was a yeah shamanic healing journey, psilocybin assisted therapy session. So we, my wife and I traveled to Calgary on January 28th, 2022, which was our 10 year wedding anniversary. Um, no coincidence, of course. And then also just to kind of give you, um, background of what was happening in the in the world specifically in Canada at that time the the freedom convoy so the trucker convoy was on their way across Canada right at that moment and so I was really feeling hope for the first time because I really disagreed and felt very strongly about how the government had really overreached and was were breaching people's charter rights so in Canada it's called the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and they were breaching people's rights and in policing we dealt with a charter all the time and when you breach someone's charter rights as a police officer there's remedies there people have their charges withdrawn or their charges stayed and there's like there's remedies when people's rights are are breached and so the charter is super important and what i saw throughout the pandemic was the complete yeah pe the government ignoring people's rights so mm -hmm. I was seeing this freedom movement happening and the support they were getting as the, the convoy was on their way to Ottawa. And it gave me hope for the first time in a long time. So it's our 10 year wedding anniversary. I'm feeling hope for the first time. And uh, that's the day of, of my healing journey. So I'd of course grown these mushrooms and brought them with me. And uh, there was a, a big ceremony involved. So there was drumming and calling in of protection and, she, she saged the whole place and it was like this legitimate spiritual ceremony which was something that I really was missing in my previous therapies um, and something that I now know is so important to in healing and so I was I was all in like I, I just love that stuff right yeah. at, at that point so I held the medicine to my heart and it is a hundred percent of medicine um, it's 
it's here for a purpose psilocybin I'm talking about and that purpose is to to help us and it has potential to help so many people so I held that medicine to my heart and I'd written out my intentions in my journal so I read my intentions three times forcefully with that medicine held to my heart and then I consumed it and my intentions were to process unresolved trauma that was causing me issues and causing me to not show up as the best version of myself yeah so I took a little bit of time and then I started feeling the effects of the medicine and I, without any resistance, without thinking about it, I went into the bedroom of the place we were staying in and I went actually right underneath the covers and without, without any sort of work or like any sort of forcing at all, I just went back chronologically to that first hard call that I had never wanted to go back to and it was a suicide related call no coincidence um went back to very early in my career and I went back to that place and I saw the situation from a new perspective so um psilocybin obviously alters your state of consciousness and allowed me to want to go back and and relive this experience and so I saw it from a different perspective and that was for me as a police officer at a, at a situation like that, I had no personal ties to the, to the person or people involved. So I had this realization that it actually wasn't even my trauma. I was just a, a witness to someone else's trauma and me holding on to that and not letting it move through me was, was just not, not helpful at all. And so that was a, a big realization I had. And then the second part was that I had this, I can, what I can only describe as radical Jesus level compassion for the people involved. <laughs> yeah. So in that particular case, um, compassion for this young lady who had, a, had um, she'd slit both of her wrists, um, the, you know, along the artery and blood was just pumping out of, out of her, her arms with every beat of her heart. And so I just had this compassion for her and what her trauma story must have looked like to get her to that moment where I was called to, um, to basically, well, to try and help her. And so compassion for her and also compassion for myself in that I started in policing to, to try and help people. And so those factors, that perspective change of that, it actually wasn't even my trauma. And then this compassion for the people involved and for myself, it just, it processed. And I've had it pointed out to me since then that compassion is the highest frequency. And so it makes total sense that the highest vibration would allow trauma mm -hmm. to process. And this, this wasn't anything I was consciously thinking of or anything of, of that sort at the time. It was just the magic of the medicine just led me exactly there. So I, I did that process for well, 15 years of policing, I went through and just did that same process with each of those hard calls that brought me right up to present time. And um, that took a few hours, I would say, I don't know exactly how long. And then it, it just kind of at that point felt complete. And I came out of the room, and the psychologist had was coming in regularly and checking on me. Um, and I didn't know what this, what the <laughs> therapy session was going to look like. Of course, I thought that there'd be a lot of like her coaching me through things and talking me through things, but that wasn't for me. That wasn't the case at all. Um, I yes. had a really strong intention, of course, that I'd written out and then stated before I'd taken the medicine. And also I was just very willing to want to go in and like actually yeah. deal with this stuff. And so that's, that's all I needed. And it, the, the medicine just, let me do all of that. And so she would come in and, and check on me. Do you need anything? Like, are you doing good? And I was just, I was good. And then, so my wife and the psychologist shaman were in the other room when they weren't, you know, when she wasn't coming in and checking on me and they were, they were getting along really well and I could hear them giggling and I'll, I'll never forget. Like, so I'm under the covers dealing with like <laughs> my like darkest stuff and I can hear them giggling in the other room and it like it would bring a smile to my face every time and it was just it was perfect like like a pattern interrupt yeah it was yeah. everything about that day was perfect and it makes it makes total sense and there's no coincidence right when you're in that place of like that openness and with that clear yeah. intention like it just makes total sense that it 
did exactly what I had asked it to do. So, so I want to pause there for a second because compassion, I think, is is so critical. And for a long time, I thought empathy and compassion were the same thing, and and they're not. Empathy is a part of compassion, but compassion is different from empathy. With the, from, this is from like the academic research and and the studies that they've done around this. Empathy is being able to understand someone's situation to 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 attempt to be in their shoes in a way, right? Whereas compassion is that too, but the second component is is the willingness or the motivation to help, to support, to encourage, to potentially challenge. It's it's the action piece to the empathy. That's what compassion is. And so that that's what I've learned in the last year and a half. And, and so writing a book that I'm uh talking like writing right now about leadership and and five c's and one of those is compassion so that was like the first thing that i thought about and it's no coincidence that you you felt that while in the medicine the second thing is uh in the eastern texts like the eastern world eastern philosophies enlightenment is can only happen through compassion and so you know that being if not the highest one of the highest modes that we can operate in as human beings learning how to cultivate that from the inside will only emanate outwards and every interaction you have that now has the potential to come through and through that compassion healing could happen uh people's genius can emerge um they they feel a, a deep connection that maybe they haven't felt in their entire life and you just become you become healer might be a strong word but i choose to look at it like that you become a healer through just your presence because of the inner work that you've done. And do you need to take psilocybin to get there? No, there are other modalities to do that, but it it can, in your case, and, and through my experience, it can expedite or provide opportunities that aren't, that open your mind to to new ways. And and so hearing your your, your story is is cool and I love it. And I'm glad that you had that experience. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and your description of of compassion, it's uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing when you can when you can get there. And I'll just tell you a quick story about like how deep that compassion went during this healing journey. So one of my hard calls that um one of my traumas was my involvement in a it was a homicide investigation um in Calgary. And so um, it was grandma and grandpa and uh, their five-year-old grandson were murdered by um, an individual who there was like a bad business thing that he'd had with the grandparents. And he um, came to the house to kill the grandparents and the grandson happened to be there. And so he killed him as well, a five-year-old. Um, and so that, that was, that was really hard for me. I was um, I spent, a lot of hours in in the scene of that homicide um, as part of a search team, um, and like the little guy's shoes were still at the back door, like it was fucking tragic. And at that point, I was a new dad, and so that was like all new too to be dealing with um, children now being a father myself. And so in my healing journey, um, I had that same sense of compassion for the the murderer um and what his trauma story must have looked like to get him to that place where he did those unspeakable things to other humans i st i still felt that compassion for him and not like yeah i'm not like giving him a pass or anything like that but i just had this like deep understanding of like hurt people hurt people and that's that's it, right? And unresolved trauma is at the root of what he did that day and is at the root of so many of the terrible things that we see in today's world is, is people walking around with this unresolved trauma and having no awareness of it and just, yeah, continuing that that cycle of it. Um, so anyways, that's that's how deep that compassion went. I I mean, hurt people do hurt people. And, and it's, I think it takes a very mature, aware individual to, to entertain someone's backstory when that person has done something significantly 
let's call it bad negative, right? Like a murder or a situation that should, should never have been done for someone to look through and say, how did that get here? As opposed to just looking at the incident and trapping that individual into that label, right? And that hatred towards the person for the thing that was done is warranted. It could be justified, but deeper is that compassion piece. And if that compassion can be acted on on many different levels throughout one's life toward other people, we can minimize those types of individuals who do those extreme things. And everyone has a story and we're all human and we all have these influences that we can control and not control. And if we learn to think like that, then we're going to be a lot more understanding and we don't have to outcast as often or exile parts of ourselves and others. Um, because truly, when we hate things externally, it's because we hate things internally, right? And and so it isn't until you do the inner work that you see holistically who a human being is and what a human being is capable of. And it's in that where true choice really can emerge. And when you see both the dark and the light of, of a human and then say, I'm going to choose X, Y, and Z, there, there's a full autonomy there, but also like there's... There's just a full spectrum understanding there too. And I think your communication skills dramatically increase. Your your ability to house and hold information to support people increases. And we as a collective can become more healed. And when we're absolutely. more healed, we do better things. Yeah, absolutely. Because the I mean, the system that we currently have where we just lock lock these people up and it's almost like eye for an eye and, and vengeance and that sort of thing like that's not healing right that's not going to get us to the place we need to be um, and i don't have an answer for what our systems need to evolve into but what we're currently doing isn't isn't going to get us to where we need to to be and um i i truly do feel the the collective consciousness rising and i'm hopeful for the future that as that continues to happen that will will come up with ways to to actually heal and to to move move forward i mean bad things are are still going to happen of course uh but to find a way to to move forward in a positive way and um and everyone is going to be better off for it yeah the the quote what you resist persists right comes comes to mind when we're absolutely. talking about this right no absolutely and that goes for trauma too right like i resisted my trauma for my entire career and it just kept showing up and kept and then over time gradually yeah changed me into something lower vibrational human condition is is just it's wild and beautiful all at the same time and yeah, it really is yeah yeah so uh so you had this experience have you had one since um so with psilocybin yes I have. Yes. I've had, I've had one since, um, and very different experience, very <laughs> Usually, healing yeah. and very insightful, but very different. Um, but it makes total sense because you get exactly out of it, what you need at that time and, and in the position you're in. And so, um, yes, I have, but not, not in that same way. Got it. Got it. Um, and so since then, and removing yourself from the, the the police force and and that kind of industry now emerging into owning your own business and doing more of a passion project and something that serves you and your community and, and even the world and how you're redefining or uh, maybe reinventing or or going a, your own way with the clothing that you're creating. Telling us, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just going to back up just a little bit before I get into that. Yeah. Um, so before my healing journey, my psychologist, who's actually a PhD psychologist and also a shaman. So she did all the standardized testing on me and whatnot. And so I was diagnosed PTSD and on the severe side, that was before my healing journey. So healing journey happens. And then about six weeks later, WCB, they had no idea what I was doing, right? Like I did this completely on my own. Yeah. Um, I had to pay for it myself and make it happen for myself. 
So they ordered a comprehensive psych assessment that happened again, six weeks later. Um, so it was a half day interviews and all the testing again. And uh, so that psychologist called me back a week later and told me that I didn't even meet the criteria for a diagnosis. So it's abundantly clear to me that this medicine with the right intention in the right circumstances with the right mindset has the potential to help so many people process trauma because what it did for me was it allowed me to go back to those yeah. dark places where in my you know normal consciousness i yeah. We just had these blocks and everything was compartmentalized, like you mentioned earlier, and like locked away tight in different corners of my body. And I couldn't access those in my normal waking state, um, tried through all the traditional therapies. And I mean, I could tell, like I told that story about, um, you know, the, the girl, the lady who cut both of her wrists and about that homicide I just told you about. And like, I could tell the story, but I, I wasn't. I wasn't going back and processing things. It was just like, I was just regurgitating a memory almost. And so the, the psilocybin allowed me to, to go in and, and just work through it and experience it and, and move it through my body. Yeah. So that was profound and it has the so much potential to help so many people, even outside of, of first responders, we all have varying levels of trauma from childhood, from all the things that happened to us in the day, our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, this medicine has, yeah, just amazing potential to, to get through those barriers that we've, we put yeah. up internally. Um, so as, as this so whole on, on that real quick, I, there, yes. have you heard of IFS internal family systems? No, I've not. It's a form of therapy where uh, it's the, the creator of his Richard Schwartz PhD. He, he, started studying um, individuals who were, you know, suffering from bulimia and these extreme conditions. And over the course of working with so many of them, he began to notice that in their description of when they would do the task they didn't want to do, like the cutting or the vomiting or whatever, that they would say something in me is telling me to do it. Like there was another entity, another part of them that was different than who they normally are. And he just kept seeing this time and time again. and was like, what is going on? Like, who is this other person? And one session, he just decided to, he asked to ask the patient to talk to that part. Like, I want to talk to whoever that is. And so the individual snapped into that part to communicate with the therapist. And then they had a dialogue and Richard, the, the, the creator of this was basically asking like, what do you want? Why are you here? And it wasn't in a judgmental way. It was in like an invitational, like clearly there's a message you're wanting to get through. What is that? And through the course of this, like created this whole internal family system kind of framework where we have parts of ourselves in ourselves that can get exiled or pushed out or uh, not entertained. And, and it isn't until we integrate and have a holistic kind of harmony between all the parts in us that we can have, you know, a better quality of life. Right. And so when you were talking about visiting these moments, that's what popped up for me. And it was like, just being present with what happened. Right. And a lot of what Richard talks about is being present with these parts that you weren't, that you haven't created space for. And it, and when you do, when you begin to communicate like that, insights start coming through, things get processed, you feel lighter, energy starts moving, and and you feel a sense of completeness, which is what you were talking about. And whether that's going through a psilocybin journey, going through a meditative experience, a breathwork session, ayahuasca, uh, or just being in nature, like, you know, there are many different ways to go. I think at the end of the day, it comes down with being present with what was, and understanding it and through the being present with it, things kind of work out for, you know, what works best for you. Um, does that align with what you were talking about? Yeah, I think exactly. And it's, it comes back to another thing you said earlier, and that was what you resist persists. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to shine a light into those dark corners of, yeah, those voices and the, that motivation and the different things, once the lights shine there and you're willing to 
go there and actually look at things, yeah, it's now all of a sudden insights and and whatnot will will come to you and yeah. you'll be able to move move past it because you're not you're not pushing it down anymore. You're you're willingly going there. And that for me was was a big um revelation I had through my journey was that I was I was putting so much energy on just pushing stuff down that once I willingly went in and, and processed that stuff, I was able to liberate a ton of energy that I was focusing inward to hold things in place. Um, when I, now I can move that through me and now that energy I can put into uh, more positive places. Beautiful. And one of those places is what you're about to talk about next. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um, going back to the very beginning of our story. So January, 2020 with that, the meditation, um, during one of my meditations early in that, um, time frame, the idea for what became my brand flow state designs came to me. And so at that time I was, I was looking for a locally made natural fiber, just good fitting quality, basic t-shirt. And I couldn't find it. I could find some brands that would check one of those boxes, but they would be, you know, polyester and made in Vietnam, or um, I could find one that maybe would check a different box, but then the other two wouldn't be wouldn't be addressed. And so in this meditation, I had the idea of like, oh, I can't find this. There must be other people that are also looking for a similar product. And so I decided at that point that I was just going to make it myself and no previous previous experience or anything like that in, in this world. I just started taking one step and just then taking the next one when that came up. And I was, I was at a point in my career where I, I obviously wasn't happy um, and doing something that felt good in my heart, which was my brand just was the opposite of what I'd done in my life up until that point. And that just felt good. So that's what I did. So during my whole trauma, you know, healing journey that I just told, talked about flow state designs was slowly building in the background. And so um, when that, doctor told me that I didn't meet the criteria for a diagnosis anymore. Of course, my WCB benefits stopped in that moment. And um, the Calgary Police Service were expecting me to come back to work. And so I was I was feeling really good. Um, and life was was I was feeling quite content in my life at that point. And going back into policing felt terrible to me the idea of that and being back in in those you know negative encounters and um, in that energy just wasn't in alignment for me anymore and I was feeling good but I felt like if I went back into that world I would just end up re-traumatizing myself and be right back in the same situation so um, that and then also I'd since witnessed the really darkness of uh, what what became of the the freedom convoy in Ottawa with the, the the Canadian government enacted the Emergencies Act to deal with peaceful protesters in the nation's capital and went in with riot police and just stomped on these people who were peacefully protesting um, mandates that the government had had put in place and they didn't even give the people a chance to talk about what their grievances were like there was no dialogue there was no interest in the, on the government's part to talk to these people so anyways i my own integrity i'm not going to be a part of that i'm not going to enforce unjust mandates i'm not going to trample on people's charter rights because the government thinks that's what i should do um, that's not how it's supposed to work and so those two factors, I made the only decision that was possible for me, and that was to resign from policing. So I put in my resignation and then um, had some leave and whatnot that had to happen administratively. And so my last day as a police officer was uh, April 20th of 2022, which was is 420. Um, so I see you, universe, like well played. Um, and so I haven't looked back since. Um, now I'm I'm going all in on my on my apparel brand, and also even primary to that actually is what we're doing right now, and that's spreading my my message. This is my my mission is to just 
potentially help people with my own story of healing and, and just show people that there's possibilities outside of traditional therapies and there's the possibility exists to truly process these traumas and this dark stuff that lives within us and to move forward in a positive way. And um, there's post-traumatic growth on the other side of it. And that's something I've experienced in a big way in my own life. So um, that brings us to today, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And what's it been like creating from the ground up uh, your, your company and those that you share it with? What's the feedback that you've been getting? Yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Um, just being in alignment and and for me producing a product that I it's the best possible product I can make at this point. It's the best possible fabric and it's the highest quality and the best possible fit and all those things. Like that's the energy I put into it. And so it's just completely in alignment for me. And like even down to and for me, I I never would have been satisfied with you know, buying a blank already made shirt, it wouldn't have been the right fabric, it wouldn't have been the right fit. Um, I'm like an attention to detail guy. So like, it took me a long time to come up with the have it fit right. I knew in my head what it was going to look like and feel like, but it took a long time to get that into physical form. And I needed to be able to have that control over it. And so even to the level of um, on the inside of the Karen content label of our shirts, I've uh, I've had a piece of clear quartz crystal, a tiny little piece of clear quartz crystal sewn into the label. And I've sent that positive energies of grace and abundance and gratitude and compassion and flow and um, a bunch of positive energies and then um, had that sewn in. So it's on your body every time you wear one of our products and it's just intentional clothing. It's everything about it is, is conscious in terms of like, it's locally made. It's sewn in Calgary, Alberta by people making a living wage using the best possible fabrics that are better for not only the people wearing them, but for the planet as well. Hemp is an amazing fiber. Um, hemp based clothing is, is amazing. It has so many positive benefits for again, both the people wearing it and for the planet. And so, um, it just feels really good to be in alignment and, um, just being, just showing up and being vulnerable and, and telling, telling my story to on stages like this. And, um, again, in the hopes that, that people can take some, something from it and, um, implement that in their own lives and their own healing journeys. And I see you have them in the background. So you have how many colors now? Uh, there's four. Yeah. Four different colors and then short and long sleeve. And I'm working on other new products all the time. So a woman's specific tee and I have plans for a whole line eventually, but starting with the men's t-shirt. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for this conversation. I'm so happy for you that you found what lights your soul on fire, what helps be, you become a better husband, father, leader. Uh, the fact that you're you're being proactive with finding the resources to make something that's locally made, I think is really big and important and something that we're missing in our uh, economic Western world, right? Where everything is like, how can I build it for the cheapest, not necessarily for the most quality or, or what's best for the environment. So thank you for, for leading the front on that. And as we, as we wrap up here, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with as far as insights? I know you're going to provide a link for them to, to go and check out some of your clothing. So maybe you could talk about that and then maybe where's the best place to get in touch with you. Yeah, I would say just, um, trauma again is something that isn't going to go away without intention and um, some sort of work. And and it's not going to be psilocybin for everyone. I totally get that. And I've since experienced um, some, some really intense breath work and that's been super profound and, and actually as intense as, as some of my, my big psychedelic yeah, experiences. Sure. And just to put in perspective, like my healing journey was, was a little over six grams of mushrooms and yeah, with just my breath, I'm able to, to go into places and, and heal things that's um, it's, it's wild. So there's different modalities for everyone. And I would just say like, there, there is hope on the other side. And I've seen and heard stories from people that just have unbelievable trauma stories, just awful, awful things that happen to them. And those end up being your gifts, the, the stuff that you can work through and, and push 
past and, and grow on the other side is you are more powerful for it on the other side. So it's, it's so worth it. Um, it's, it's not easy of course, but again, so worth it. Um, and then as far as the, the clothing goes, um, yeah, I, I want to share a, a, a link with a, with a, a sizable discount on it. And just, I'm just, I want to get this clothing out and, and into the, onto people. Cause it, it has its own healing properties with the crystal in it and with the energy that I've put into the, the clothing and the way it's been designed and, and made and all of that. And so I just want to get that uh, out and, and on people um, as far and wide as possible. And then, and my story as well as, as far and wide as possible. So I just appreciate very much the time to, and the platform to be able to share my story. And um, this has been great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Instagram would be best way website. Yes. Yep. So, uh, Instagram is probably the, the primary one, but I'm pretty active on TikTok um, as well. Hey, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to break out of this, uh, old guy mentality. So <laughs> yeah. And we can put all those, all those links in yeah, the, sure. in the notes. Um, but yeah. And if anyone wants to reach out, tra ta sorry, trauma specific or, or chat or whatever, I'm very open to hearing from people as well. So we can put uh, my contact details in there. That would be awesome. Yeah, beautiful. Nick, I appreciate you, brother. I hope you have a great day and uh, thank you for your heart, man. Thank you. And I appreciate you for, for yours and, and what you're doing and putting out into the collective. It's amazing. So thank you. Thank you.